we are going to be looking in Acts chapter 2. We were there a few weeks ago, and then we had a little something called Palm Sunday and Easter, and, uh, and now we're getting back to Acts chapter 2. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles there. We'll be starting in verse 42. Um, just a, a little sidebar conversation. Uh, after this week and next week, we're going to be unpacking this passage, and then we'll be kicking off a series. Uh, we're going to be looking at the churches in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. And if God were to write a letter to the church today, I think he would highlight a lot of the same things that are in that letter to those churches long ago. And so we'd love for you to be a part of that series with us, and we look forward to it. On Sunday nights, we'll be looking at a very little book, uh, Third John, and there's a lot to learn in Third John. So um, hopefully you'll be able to make your way out here and enjoy these times in the Word with us. You know, as a man, I am not a very good cook. I know many men that are. I am not. A matter of fact, I only know of three true spices, salt, pepper, and ketchup. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I'm in trouble if I'm having to make it on my own. Uh, when Cheryl leaves, I subsist on peanuts and Diet Coke. So if she's ever gone for a period of time, please have me over for dinner or I will wither away. It's going to be a problem. Um, I, I, I don't know how she can make things taste so good. There's herbs, there's spices, there's ingredients that she just puts into a chicken or that she can just put into a cake or that she can just put into whatever it is she's preparing. And, and many times she'll send me out and she'll say, could you get a sprig of basil? I'm like, what's basil, <laughs> right? P point it out to me, sure. You know, how about some, I, don't, I still don't know if it's, if it's thyme or thyme. Do we even know who has any idea? But, but uh, someone that takes care in putting the proper ingredients and in, in getting savvy and good things put together, uh, I'll tell you, they can make a dish that's wonderful. Someone like me, pretty bland, pretty basic. We hear in this passage, we, we have an ingredients of a passionate church. Uh, in the ingredients of a church that is just laying it on the line for the Lord Jesus Christ that loves each other and loves God. And I think it's uh, not a clear cut cookie cutter model that we can just drop into our church today, but the themes, the themes of what makes a church healthy are absolutely in this passage. So let's read it together and be edified. Starting in verse 42, it says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And so we spent a lot of time a few weeks ago really unpacking that idea of what was the apostles' teaching. And we said, today we have the word of God fully and completed. And so we have the apostles' teaching. We open it up and we emphasize it every Sunday. So we praise the Lord for that. And the fellowship of breaking of bread and prayers and awe came upon every soul and many, wonders and, sign, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as many as had need. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Here in this visit, vivid description, what we see is that the early church was filled with loving people. That they took off their masks. They radically lived life together, not just in word, but in deed. They served and loved each other with a reckless abandon. They obliterated all racial, economic, cultural barriers that existed. They actually believed that 95% devotion to the Lord was 5% too little. 
They wanted to be complete followers of Christ in every way. They loved each other like family and glad, gladly met each other's needs until it hurt a little. Not just casually, but radically. They treated property, possessions, and abilities like they really belonged to God in true reality. The outside world looked in and they absolutely had their breath taken away. As a matter of fact, their enemies described them as those who turned the world upside down because of what was going on in this early church. Whether you look at Acts 2 or Acts chapter 16, it tells us that they were so attractive that they added to their numbers daily that they were continuing to grow, they were continuing to thrive, they were continuing to see new converts come to Christ. And so these verses are filled with vision and encouragement for us as a ministry today. One of the main words that we kind of pulled out last time we were together was the word devoted, that they devoted themselves They devoted themselves. They were passionate about a few very important things. And by the idea of devoted, we mean this. They knew they needed it. They needed to be together. They needed to be generous. They needed to be in the house of God with the people of God. And hearing the apostles' teaching. And what we know is this, that when you hear the apostles' teaching correctly, not just for head knowledge, but to also apply it to your life, something trickles down from just instruction, and that's proper worship. So as the word of God is being taught, as the apostles were preaching and teaching, the people heard what was being said and then they began to apply it to their lives and that created great worship. And it said in their worship experience, there was awe, that they were truly in awe of what God was doing and truly in awe of the gospel of God, truly in awe of everything that the Lord was teaching them and the apostles were sharing with them. And and again, they didn't have the full New Testament, so I'm sure they sat with them and said, tell us again how we're to pray. And they would share with them that story of how Christ taught them to pray. Tell us us again on on how he, he walked on water. And Peter didn't have faith. Right, And they would share these stories and they were on the edge of their seat, but they didn't just put it in their heads, they also applied it to their lives and wanted to become more and more like the one they loved, Jesus Christ, together. And so we said that they were fully offered to God in Christ-centered worship. Fully offered to God in Christ-centered worship. They met formally. Um, It says that they they gathered together. To do what? Well, it says to break bread. Now it also, if you drop down to verse 46, it says that they enjoyed breaking bread in each other's homes, and that was more in a fellowship way, in a hospitality way. But this first section, when it says that they broke bread together and devoted themselves to that, it's talking about communion. It's talking about the opportunity that we have to come together as a church body and to remember Christ's beautiful sacrifice to remember that our sins were paid for, that we've been redeemed and justified. And these are good things to remember as a family together. And so we come together and we remember these things around the communion table. We look at our lives and we examine our lives together around the communion table. And we realize that Christ is going to return and we remember that when we take communion together. These are great times to encourage us as the body of Christ. That Jesus Christ paid it all. That our sins are forgiven. That we are given a life that will be victorious. We're not trapped in our sins any longer. And that he's coming back. And we want to make sure that that we put this before each of you um, fairly often. And so we've decided that we will have communion together on the first Sunday of every month. That we're going to come together and we're going to remember Christ. We're going to 
celebrate that meal and break bread together in remembrance of these important things and examine ourselves together. And so we're excited to do that and to make that little change. Talking about the ordinances, there's also this idea that there was baptism. Now, you won't see it in the little section we read, but in verse 41, it says that as people were being saved, they immediately were, were baptized. And, and so we want to put a priority in baptism here as well. And I just want to throw out a little commercial. On the 22nd of this month, we're going to have a baptismal. And if you would like to be baptized and be obedient in that first step of your faith journey, We'd love for you to let us know, uh, give us a call, um, and, and be a part of that special time together where the church is going to be able to hear your story of how you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and now you're risen in newness of life. And, uh, and, and we can celebrate that changed life together. It's, it's a wonderful thing to participate in a baptism. And so they loved getting together and they loved doing these ordinances, these important things together, the preaching of the word. They loved to break bread and do communion together and they loved to see people come to Christ and seeing them baptized together. These are good, life-giving things to the church and we wanna make sure that we prioritize those things and put them where God would put them. They were very serious about their gatherings. They were serious about coming together at the temple and worshiping together corporately. We are jealous for you to be here. Coming together, gathering together as the church is important. And I'm not just saying that because I'm the pastor. It's good, it's biblical. It's taught. This isn't a hobby that we do. It's a commitment. It, it is something that, that God asks us not to forsake. That, that we should come together, gather together as the church, and we encourage each other. We love each other. We serve each other on Sundays, and, and, and it can't be the way that we treat sometimes our diets. You know, we mix in a salad once a month, whether we need it or not, and then we pour ranch dressing all over it, which kind of defeats the purpose anyway, right? And you say, well, I did what was good for me. Sometimes we treat church like that. We show up once a month, say, whew, did my job. He was a little long today, but I, I sucked it up, made it through. We, we want to encourage you to be a part of our time together, our gatherings. You know, we testify the gospel to each other when we come together at church. When we open up our mouths and we sing, we testify the gospel. When we are doing life in front of each other and encouraging each other, right? I mean, uh, today, I, I have to say, uh, Phyllis came up to me in, in her walker and big smile and all that she's been through, right? And what did she do? She testified the gospel to me. God's good all the time, right? And, and that's why we come to church, because we need this encouragement. We need this real life on life. Hey, out there in the world, people don't always think like us, act like us, or love the things we love. So we come together so that we find unity, so that we find encouragement. And literally, the word says that we pour courage into each other in Hebrews. Encourage one another. What is that? It's, it's, it's I, am, I am waning and so I come to church and I hear a word and I see the gospel being played out in the lives of brothers and sisters and I sing a word and these things help encourage and build up and strengthen me so that I can leave here again and be what God's called me to be. And so this is a, a opportunity, a meal and encouragement for us. And, and when we come together, it reminds us that we belong to something that's bigger than us, that we belong to something that is ultimate. Because sometimes during our week, 
lesser gods become ultimate and important. And so we come to restore that all and that, that love for the Lord. We belong to something, we just don't believe in something. And that's why it's good to come to church. It's not a building that we go to, it's a family that we belong to. And he talks about this being a church family and, and, and what he's talking about is that there are, were, were, were people that covenanted together, people that did life together. They were brothers in verse 47, it says, believers. And unfortunately, you might say, you know what, I'm just a person that doesn't enjoy people getting all up in my business. I don't want people to know me. I don't want people to care about me. I don't want people to, to really fuss with me. It's just easier if I can just disappear. It's just easier if I can hide. But, but that's not what we come to church to do. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. We come together and we kind of shake each other and we encourage each other and say, hey you, he's coming back, we got work to do. Let's go. It also says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer. And now this is a, a little bit of a, a bad translation because in the Greek it's the prayers. And so he's saying that they devoted themselves to the prayers. It's saying corporate. This is corporate prayer he's talking about. And so certainly there's an idea of private prayer in this passage, but this particular word he's talking about corporate prayer. And so what do we do? We come together and we pray. How do we do that? In songs, those are prayers. We also do that publicly. We take the time to pray. And we hope that in every one of the meetings that we're involved in that, that has Bible Baptist connected to it, there is a time of prayer. No matter what you're involved in here, we hope that you start that meeting with some prayer. We hope that you end that meeting with some prayer. Prayer is important, it's vital. We just don't go about our business. We depend on Christ for everything. And so we, we need to make sure that we're a praying people and, and the secret of the early church, what's the secret sauce here? They were completely dependent on the Lord. They prayed and prayed and prayed. They were desperate for more of the Lord. You know, I've heard it said that what was fundamental for the early church has gradually become supplemental in the contemporary church in regards to prayer. In other words, in the early church, they were desperate for prayer. They were desperate for more of God. They cried out together, Lord, you know, as we sang today, awaken us, Lord, rain down on us. Lord, bring us more of your glory, more of your direction, more of your awe. And, and now we use prayer kind of supplementally, you know, we'll, we'll quickly get it in here and there. Maybe we'll gather together with some friends and pray. Maybe we won't. We need to truly believe with all of our heart that God's presence and power are here for us. And we're to ask. You have not because you ask not. They were encouraging each other through these prayers and time of prayer. When we pray for someone, I, I, anytime I've ever been prayed for, it's been an encouragement to me. Anytime. Anytime someone says, Pastor, I want you to know something, looks me in the eye and says, I pray for you. There, there, you, there is no more powerful thing that you could say to me than I bring your name before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's nothing that could be greater and so we do this for each other. We set aside times to pray. On the 
in the weekly, as you, as you look through it and the things that come up and take place, there are times for us to gather together and pray. And if at all possible, you know, let's elevate this. Become truly, truly a, a dependent and prayerful congregation. And so they came and they, they prayed and they encouraged each other. Not only that, they worshiped together and they realized that worship just isn't something that you did in church, but it was something that you did out of church. Um, I was wondering if Dan could come up here and give me a hand. I did warn his wife ahead of time. I didn't warn him because he might say no, but she said yes, so you can blame her. And, and Brian, could you help me out here too? You can stand next to my friend here. All right. There are three different places, perhaps, that we could worship, let's just say. So let's say one is, is a personal time. And we want to encourage every one of you to be in the word and to spend time with the Lord. Have a personal time of discipleship and equipping. So Brian, I hate to do this, but you're young and spry. Could you kind of get down on your knees and just, you're, you're doing some, some personal time. You're doing good. And, and, and so we're going to take time out of our, our, our week to just get away, have our, our prayer sheet out, open up the word of God, and just spend some time in personal time. Now, a few weeks ago, we took some time and really kind of opened this up a little bit more. And, and I hope um, that we have begun to open up God's word and to spend that daily time in the word. Uh, this gentleman, he, he worships at church, so go ahead and lift your hands up as, as, you know, hey, we're a Baptist church, a little lower, a little lower, you know. <laughs> there, there we go. I'm just messing with you. But, but, but we worship the Lord publicly. We, we come together, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and, and we get rekindled and encouraged that there's good worship. But then there's, there's another type of worship, and, and I'm at work, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, going through my day. And, and here's the thing. We don't compartmentalize worship. We are worshipers all the time. We're worshipers when we're having our private devotions. We're worshipers when we're in church worshiping, but we're also worshipers when we're, we're at work. We're also worshipers when we're at school. We're also worshipers when we're out there on a ball field. You know, I've seen some of the nicest guys turn into some of the crankiest people when you put them involved in a sporting event. They're the worst worshipers ever. Why? Because they were worshiping that. We can compartmentalize our lives really good and we can do this so that we have our quiet time. Oh, I, I did that for today. Phew, I'm done my worship until Sunday. Then we show up Sunday, there we go, I did my worship there, and, and we can live like we wanna live and do what we wanna do throughout the rest of the week. God says that is not worship. We are worshipers every day, at every moment, in everything that we do. The question is who you're worshiping or what are you worshiping? And so what we want to be an encouragement as a body together is, is, is that we love each other to the point where we can say, hey, have a private time of worship, yes. Come together and worship, yes. But how about in all of life? Be a worshiper of the one that deserves your worship. And that's the Lord. Thank you. Don't go too far because I will have you up again in, in, in a little bit. You know, some people say, but Brian, you don't understand, my work it just isn't that important. My work doesn't do that much. Uh, you know, I'm just a this or I'm just a that and I don't really have a lot of impact. Um, the other day we sponsored here uh, Work as Worship. It was just a time to get together and, and, and to be encouraged by many people that, that just kind of hit on this very theme, that there, there is no secular and sacred, but it's all God's. 
and we're all together. And whatever we do, we can do, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, you can do all to the glory of God and it has an impact. And here was a, a young lady and it's a video about a, a young lady that's a florist and she thought, you know what? My job really doesn't have any impact or any meaning. I think it would be good for us to watch this this morning. I'm just a florist. Got a small shop, nothing special. Silly way to spend your life, I guess, fussing with a bunch of flowers. Sometimes I wish I was good at something else. I don't know, a doctor or a missionary, someone who really helps people. But I do love flowers. I always had a knack for it. So I do my best to make them beautiful for people. But I know flowers can't change the world. I know I don't make much of a difference. I'm just a florist. I'm just a florist. That what we do can be redemptive. You know, Adam worshiped the Lord in the garden with Eve by naming animals. It wasn't some kind of a, a message that he preached or a song that he sung, he was just faithful. He was faithful to do what God gifted him to do and equipped him to do, which was to sit there and bring order to the creation that he gave. And he did it with all his heart. We, whatever you're called to do, have an opportunity to, to do it as unto the Lord, to the very best of our abilities for God's glory and worship him in those ways. The second thing, we're not gonna spend much time in point number two because I think we unpacked it quite a bit the last time we met, but they were radically devoted to Christ through discipleship, through times in the word, through uh, opportunities of prayer and praying without ceasing. They were devoted to God in these ways. Thirdly, they were irrevocably committed to each other through generosity. If you look at verse 44, it says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as many as had need. And so what we see here is, is a group of people that, that just loved each other, not just in word, but also in deed. And they had this, this opportunity to, um, some had more than others and, and they made sure that they were blessing each other, that they were meeting each other's needs. Now, this isn't socialism or communism. There were some that had much, some that had little, that came together in the same church. It wasn't that God thinks that all of us should have equal. That's not even what you see in the scriptures. Some God blesses with more and some God provides what they need. 
But here's what I can tell you. As a church, we should be a generous people. As a church, we should be looking to meet needs. The Holy Spirit should be splashing through this ministry that as I have been blessed and encouraged and given, it should kind of splash onto my brothers and sisters that are discouraged or that don't have. And this isn't just generous in financial things. Let's be generous in forgiveness. Let's be generous in encouragement. Let's be, let's be not holding grudges, but we can just be generous with each other. Be generous with the fact that, man, I really worked hard and didn't even get a thank you no. Be generous with the fact that, boy, I, 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 this happened and, and I didn't get a visit or I didn't have this. Be generous. But certainly, in this particular way, they were also generous with their stuff. Randy Alcorn says this, if your life doesn't resound with a thunder of generosity, you have not been struck with the lightning of grace. I think what he's getting at is this, Weren't we all impoverished, spiritually speaking? Weren't we all poor? Weren't we all broken? Weren't we all in great need? And if you come from that place and the question is asked, who is your neighbor, as was asked of Jesus, we realize that our neighbor is anyone that's in need. You know, at that same event, work is worship, there was a pastor, a large pastor, very, uh, uh, not a large pastor, a pastor of a large work. He would appreciate me clarifying that. And, and, and he shared that he grew up very, very meager means. His mom was single mom and she worked very hard but they didn't have very much. And he said he remembered going to church and he didn't like it at all as a young boy because the kids would kind of make fun of him and say, you're wearing that again? Is that all you have? He said it was actually a very cruel place to be. And he said what appalls him now that he's a pastor is that here were really good people, really wonderful people, but no one noticed how much they were really struggling. He said, they really never came to help us. That was convicting. There are people in need in our community. Number one, if that's you, we're family. Let us love you. Share your need. Let's lay pride down and be a family. But secondly, we should be always sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading on who, on when, on how. Now I wanna brag on this church a little bit. This is a generous church. I have already experienced more than I can stand up here and, and share without breaking down. You all have been so generous to my family. I've seen you be generous to one another in beautiful and powerful ways. I look at the health of our benevolence budget and I just grin thinking these people care. They care about meeting needs. So praise God and, and we are by and large a generous church. The question I have is are you generous? Is that part of your life? Are you sensitive to the Holy Spirit? And, and here's the thing, these people were generous with whatever, like they didn't hold something back. What was going on is there were um, like 3,000 people added to the church and they were kind of losing their jobs. They were kind of being cast out of their families. They didn't really have anywhere to go and, and, and they, needed, they needed transportation. They needed a roof over their heads. They needed food. They needed someone to care for them. And there were people that had extra homes in this church. There were people that had extra transportation. There were people that had extra food and they said, come, use ours. They just loved like Christ loves. And it wasn't even a question. There was no embarrassment to it. There was no you owe me attached to it. It was just simple here. This is what the church does. This is how we love. This is how we serve. You have a need. I'm gonna pray and ask the Lord if I can meet your need and how to do that with wisdom and grace like he would want me to. May we be 
a generous people. And, and, and may we say, hey, there isn't a person that's truly suffering in this body because we have all rallied around and loved them. Now, that also means that there should be some responsibility on whoever's part there is a need. Um, we, we, we don't feed a bad habit or a fool. And so we, we have to use ways in which we can teach and train and encourage those things. So there's a way to do this in a way that it doesn't hurt the individual that we're actually trying to help. But by and large, let's be generous and serve. You know, there's this idea of koinonia. It's a biblical word that connects with the church. Fellowship, community is all about koinonia. And, and, and in this passage, you see that there was hospitality, that they were eating in homes. You know, uh, today after church, uh, we are going to be part of a Sunday school small group, an ABF, and we're going to have a meal together. We're going to break bread together. We're going to fellowship together. You're in a, a root group, and, and I hope that you spend some time breaking bread together and fellowshipping together. There's something good about that. There's something healthy about that. Being in these small groups, enjoying koinonia. And they did that. They disciplined themselves to doing that. When was the last time you had someone in your home for a meal? The Bible tells us that we should be a hospitable people. And it's not, there's a difference between hospitality and entertaining. It's not entertaining. Entertaining, still have masks on. Entertaining, still trying to do everything just so, and you actually become more like a Martha than a Mary. You're too busy to really sit and enjoy and be edified and grow in doing life together. What we're not talking about is entertain each other. We're talking about let's have some real hospitality where we sit around a table and we just open up our hearts and our lives and our concerns and we pray about those things and we challenge each other where we need to be challenged and there's no weirdness about that, but it's asked for and hoped for when we get together. That's, that's brothers and sisters, koinonia. First Peter 1.22, love one another deeply from the heart. Koinonia. Hebrews 10.24, 24. 24. <laughs> Spur one another on toward love and good deeds. 1 Peter 4, 9, open your hearts to each other. I have a question, do you believe? Do you believe that you can grow to full maturity in Christ, just you and your Bible alone? Just you and your Bible. Maybe every once in a while a Sunday preacher on TV. I can grow, I can be a fully devoted follower of Christ. Just me, my Bible, and, and maybe my podcast. I'm good. I fully believe that there is a certain level of spiritual growth that can only be attained through small groups of people getting together, functioning biblically. I believe that. We're not called to go it alone. God wants to redeem and restore us, and community is a part of that restorative process. It just is. And without it, we're gonna be in trouble. And so we have something that we really want to continue to elevate. We wanna see it even develop and grow a little bit broader, and that's our root groups. Um, we love the fact that we have an ABC approach to our, youth, our, our root groups. Um, First of all, the root group allows the message to take root, pun included, uh, intended there, because uh, we go over the message together, kind of rehash it, and we take it from proclamation, which is me spitting it out at you on a Sunday, and we talk about it more transformationally. Okay, now, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, how does this apply? How does this connect? What are we supposed to do with this in real life, in real time? And so there's an application part of this. There's also a build, authentic relationships as we come together, and a care and accountability, a practical love. You know, we need each other. The Bible couldn't make it clearer. 
When it talks about people meeting in small groups, if you say, is that in the New Testament? That's like saying, is there sand at the seashore? It's all over the New Testament. I mean, it's a big theme. We need to enjoy getting together in these small groups and, and, and being a part of koinonia. We need each other, but we often tend to reject it. Why? Because being together and really investing in each other's lives is messy. It's not clean and tidy. It's not easy. It's not on your schedule. It's not on your time. Matter of fact, you can't even schedule it or time it all the way. And we're, we're programmed for isolation. This world, especially in the United States of America, rigor, rugged individualism, right? Who doesn't enjoy the on-demand button in your TV? I have complete control when I want it, how I want it, whatever I want to watch. And so we have this isolation. Um, we can hide in our phones and act like we have 500 friends, but we're really not talking to anybody. You know, I, I, I struggle with wanting isolation. I am not an extrovert, I'm an introvert. So I am a public person and I enjoy being in front of people, but how I charge my batteries is withdrawing. How I charge my batteries is being alone. And so I have an extrovert wife and she says, you know, we're gonna have a lot of people over and you're just gonna have to deal with it, <laughs> right? It's good for you, buddy. And I'm like, I know, I'll get there. And I can tell you this, there's never been a time that after they left, I said, boy, I wish that didn't happen. But there's been a lot of times before you show up, I say, boy, I wish you weren't coming. <laughs> right, let's just be honest. But that's what we need. We need to break those barriers and just say, all right, we're not gonna be isolationist. We're gonna move towards each other and do life together. Because it's biblical, it's right, and I need it and you need it. If we're going to get to where God wants us to be as his children, this has got to be a part of our lives. There's another reason why we struggle. It's because we're busy. We're busy people. How can I add another thing? How can I add that individual into my life? Ma'am, sir, we're busy and relationships are time consuming. And we want to just pat them on the shoulder and say, I'll pray for you. Don't talk to me anymore though, I got you, and kind of run on. And lastly, it's difficult because we're all broken and we're all ashamed of that in some way. Um, it's not my top five thing to do to tell you that I'm broken, right? That, that I have things I'm working on, things that God's working on me about. Um, and then look at you and say, and you're broken. And here's some ways that, that, that maybe we can love each other and support each other and have accountability in our lives so that we can see these things by God's grace become victories in our lives. I can tell you that there are some strongholds that have been torn down in my life that never, ever, ever would have been torn down without community, period. I couldn't have gotten victory on it alone, nor should I have tried. Maybe you're stuck in a stronghold, but you've never been a part of a small group or you've never really been open and honest about a sin struggle or a challenge that you have. I'm gonna encourage you. They went and broke bread together with open hearts, it says. Now that means it was a trusting environment though, doesn't it? It means that they could feel the freedom to be free to share their hearts. There's some places it's not safe to do that. We need to be the kind of place where it would be. Can I have my two guys up here again? Would you link arms? It's show tunes. <laughs> This is koinonia. This is together. This is friendship. This is love. This is what God has called us to. Now, 
release yourselves and walk away from each other and just smile and wave real quickly. <laughs> That's the average Sunday guy. Right there. How you doing? Please don't talk to me for more than 10 minutes. <laughs> right? And if you do, just make it about sports, the weather, or work. Don't go personal. Don't go to any kind of a deeper level. You know, we just want, we want that wave. How you doing? I do care. Good to see you. Looking sharp, dude. And then and let's just move on. What guy is like, ooh, let me share my feelings. <laughs> I've got issues. No. But here's the thing. When we're together in Koinonia, go ahead and get back together, guys. Restoration happens better. You see, he could be having an issue in his marriage and he could just carry that burden on. But together with a friend who has experienced some of the similar things, they could encourage each other and we could see real growth in their lives. One could be going through some awful financial difficulties, but, but he, he, he opens up and he shares that and the whole team begins to pray and God just does some kind of a miraculous thing, even through their own small group to just love on them and encourage them and be there for them in a time of need. And it's all because he shared his heart. Things are difficult at work and they're able to run that race together and just check up on each other. It's more than just show up at church, how are you, fine, how are you, fine. That's not community. You know what that is? That's hypocrisy. Because we're not. We're broken. We need more of Christ and we need to love each other. Most churches are filled with terminally casual relationships. And to be honest, that's where I'm most comfortable. But it's not right. It's not what God has for us. It's not the best. And I want the best for us at Bible Baptist Church. So we live lives that reject busy isolationism. You guys getting weirded out holding our hands that long? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the other thing scripture says in accountability. It says that we're blind to our own infirmities. That there are times that I don't even see that I'm drifting. That I don't even see I'm going manic. That I don't even see that I'm moving away. And, and here's what's neat. When we really have someone that loves us and is contending with us and doing life with us, they'll tap us on the shoulder and say, hey, are you okay? Because something seems a little off. I'm just, I love you. You know that. I've already been there for you. We've already broken bread together. We've already been honest with each other. Are, are we good? Because I think something's wrong. I, I saw the way that you talked to your wife. It just, mm, not right. What's happening? We need to be asking each other, hey, how you doing in the word? Are you maintaining purity? Are you coveting? You're gossiping. I, I've heard you. Needs to stop. Are you being faithful in your prayer life? If you're a single couple dating, is there someone that you, that you have as a mentor that asks you, are you guys maintaining purity in your relationship? It's hard. Are you doing that? If you say, listen, I've been at church 25 years and no one's ever asked me a question like that, then I don't know what you call what you've been coming to, but it's not community. Because community goes there. Community cares. Not pews, but circles and coffee tables where we're being real with each other. Can I ask you a question? Who do you process your failures to? It's 
It's Galatians 6, 2 says they shared their troubles. It didn't say they fixed them. It says they shared them. I think there's an important difference. There, there are times that, that you don't want someone to try to fix you. You just want to share. This is heavy on my heart. This is a struggle. This is a difficulty. And they had a, a place that they could share their struggles and not feel judged, not feel condemned, not feel beat up. And we, we want our small groups to look and feel that way. You know, a wise person said this, you can never be totally loved until you're completely known. You can't be totally loved until you're completely known. So if the Bible says that we're to love each other, then that means that somebody needs to know us, the real us, not the better version of Brian that often walks around. If you're here today and you have a spiritual struggle, that's not a sign of weakness, it's the sign of a pulse. We all do. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says many Christians are unthinkably horrified when a real sinner is discovered among the righteous. So we remain alone in our sin, living in lies and hypocrisy he who is alone with his sin is utterly and completely alone. I've made a choice. I don't want to be alone in my sin. I want to have a companion and Christ running with me, growing, pushing, praying along with me. Acts 2, they devoted themselves to the fellowship of believers, not casual relationships, but fellowship. Lastly, they continuously applied to ministry through service. They were involved in service. Guys, can you have your arms straight out? Here we go. The Bible says that we're to serve each other. There you go, like a waiter, come on. That we come to church and we look for ways that we can serve each other. We look for ways that we can encourage each other. Uh, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? How can I be there for you? Uh, they were contagiously looking for ways to come and not make church about them, but, but, but make it about the Lord. And they wanted to fight against any kind of consumeristic attitude. Uh, casual convenience or, or something like that, and they wanted to contend um, for serving each other. Now, here's what can easily happen, is instead of coming with an attitude to serve each other, instead of coming to, with an attitude of how can I use my gift to love this congregation, to love this body, we often, instead of having a towel like that, we turn it into a bib. And we come to church and we say, feed me. We come to church and say, love me, serve me, do for me, give me. That this is what we need to look like. We fall over each other to serve each other. We fall over each other to love each other, to give to each other. And we're not coming to be consumers. Why do you think Acts 2 Church was so attractive? Because none of this stuff's natural. It's the Spirit of God raging through His church. And there is something beautiful and different. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one towards another. And so I pray for each of us together that these things, these elements would be seen and alive and passionate in this ministry. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our Father, we're so thankful for this time together. Lord, we ask that you would be glorified in this body. Lord, help us to rage against, to fight against, to push against the pensity to be involved in individualism, the desire to serve self instead of serve others, the slippery slope of hiding 
in our own sin, Lord, in ignoring community and prayers and your word. Lord, we're so thankful for the model that we were able to unpack and see today of the early church, a broken church, a messed up church, but yet a church that did contend and love you were in awe of what you were doing and loved each other. May we model that here today and may you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.